We're going to do a retroperitoneal approach today uh, for partial nephrectomy. This is a 47-year-old female who uh, presented with right upper quadrant pain for one year. She has a past medical history significant for uh, disinfundal plication in 2004 and then exploratory laparotomy uh, for endometriosis in 2006. She uh, presented uh, with this pain and underwent an ultrasound which showed a 2.4 centimeter mass in the right kidney and then a CT scan revealed a 2.4 by 2.5 centimeter mass in the right kidney. Next slide. And as you can see here, uh, the mass in the mid portion of the kidney uh, is pretty much endophytic uh, completely within the kidney. Uh, and uh, next slide please. On coronal, you can see it's uh, again mid portion of the kidney underneath the cortex of the, of the kidney. Next slide. So we have a 2.5 centimeter mass. Uh, her POTOA score is 9. Her, nephrom her nephrometry score is a 10A. And uh, her metastatic evaluation was negative. So uh, next slide. We are choosing to do a retroperitoneal approach in her because of the location of the tumor as well as the, her previous surgery. She's had two previous surgeries in the abdomen. The patient's in a true flank position, and we have her flexed to increase the space between the 12th rib and iliac crest. Next slide. And this is a view from the back. We use soft positioning, just uh, blankets and pillows. Uh, we don't use any beanbag or anything hard, and this holds them in great position. Next slide. We're going to use a four trocar configuration. That's what we have currently in place. Uh, we have the camera above the iliac uh, crest in the mid-axillary line. And we actually bring our trocars down more towards the iliac crest than, than classically described for retroperitoneal surgery. This gives us more room to get the robot in place. The assistant is anterior in the anterior axillary line, and the distance between the right arm and the assistant is critical to avoid conflict. It has to be at least six centimeters apart. So our trocars are about seven to six to seven centimeters uh, apart from camera to left and right hand. Next slide. And this is what it looks like. Uh, again, anterior axillary line, mid-axillary line, and then, um, and then we have the left robotic arm on the posterior axillary line. Next slide. The robot has been brought in and docked over the patient's head parallel to the spine. This is in distinction to the transperitoneal approach where the robot's brought in uh, perpendicular to the back. So this is uh, uh, going to be a nice demonstration of the retroperitoneal approach. Uh, in, in comparison with the transperitoneal approach, I would say uh, probably n over 90% of uh, robotic partial nephrectomies are being done as a transperitoneal approach and the modification uh, with that, Jim, do you want to uh, talk about a little bit about the uh, comparisons of uh, port placement and patient positioning uh, with a transperitoneal approach versus a retroperitoneal approach? Yeah, I think um, we just, can you, can you hear me, Ben? Yeah, it's a, a great audio feed as well. Okay, great. So, um, well, the, I, I kind of touched on some of the differences. Obviously, when we go retroperitoneal, we're behind the kidney. And this structure we're looking at here is a very important, there's two, two important landmarks here, the psoas muscle, and then this is gerotus fascia, or the posterior uh, leaf of gerotus fascia, or the psoas fascia. You can call it either, either what you want, but this is a very important landmark, and this is gonna be our landmark throughout the procedure. We're gonna know where that cut edge is, because that's gonna help us stay inside and on the kidney. So down below, we can see the vena cava, we can see one of her ureters, and here's her gonadal vein over here. So we're going to try and stay away from this stuff because one of the things we try to avoid with retroperitoneal surgery is making an inadvertent communication with the peritoneum. That's the peritoneum right up there, and you can see it's very thin. And right now we have an excellent space because we haven't created a communication with the transperitoneal space. But if I make a hole in that, then I'm going to lose my space and it's going to make the procedure harder. Not impossible, but it's going to make it harder. So I'm going to make an incision here about a centimeter above the, uh, above the psoas muscle in the in gerotus fascia here. So here we go. And you can see it's truly a sac. It's just... And I'm going to stay on the psoas muscle because that's going to direct me right to the renal hilum. Looks like we've got a little vessel back here, a little polar vessel, or a little uh, accessory vessel coming around here. And let's just quit that thing. That's pretty good size. And for the audience, uh, as uh, Dr. Porter had pointed out, really, in the retroperitoneal approach, keeping the, the psoas muscle and the horizontal orientation really maintains a perspective uh, so that you don't uh, lose landmarks. In the, in the transperitoneal approach, certainly, uh, because the anatomy is somewhat uh, more, uh, more familiar, the, uh, you, one can maintain the orientation. 
are, are you using the 30-degree uh, down lens, uh, Jim, or zero degree? This is a zero scope. So, um, and many times. Yeah. So, yeah, we have a zero scope, and I completely agree that it's easy to get disoriented. And we may have a little small hole here already, which we didn't create. I don't know how that's there, but we're going to keep a, a close eye on that. Um, anyway, we are using a zero degree scope, and we only use a 30 degree up in certain cases. But it's really important to stay oriented on the psoas muscle and the vena cava. So you're going to see very quickly. There's a ureter there. You can see the uh, ureter right there. Jim, do you have a, a preference on instruments? Uh, and uh, could you comment just a little bit on whether there's any value to using the fourth arm? Yeah. If you're even able to. Uh, hold on, Eric. Can you turn up the, uh, the audio? I can't really hear him that well. Eric, that's a great question. I have a fenestrated bipolar in my left hand. And this gives me bipolar capability. I have monopolar scissors in the in the right, and there's no, just not enough room for a fourth arm retroperitoneally. I like the fourth arm trans, and I like to use it a, a lot for trans, but there's just not enough space um, to do this retroperitoneally. So we're seeing vena cava here. That's the backside of vena cava, and then the artery is going to be coming on the backside right around here. So we're just going to take our time and do some dissection here. Nance, why don't you come on up here, please? Give me, give me what you got. There you go. You can see for the audience also that the, the, the role of the bedside assistant is really crucial in order to help him in retraction. Uh, as you can see how the uh, bedside assistant is using the sucker to help elevate and keep the tissues on a little bit of traction in order to aid the, uh, uh, in the dissection. Hey, Jim, beautiful exposure. It's uh, Mike Woods here. I have a question for you. Have you uh, had any patients had any previous renal surgery for stone disease, and does that change your approach uh, when you look at these patients? Um, actually, we have done a few patients um, who've had previous renal surgery, and we've been able to do them retroperitoneally. Obviously, the space is not as wide open as, as you're seeing today, and you have to do a, a little bit more sharp dissection initially. What you didn't see is we, we, we developed this space with a balloon dilator, and that balloon dilator allowed us to create this space before we actually started our carbon dioxide. That's very difficult to do when somebody's had previous surgery, and you have to do a lot more manual dissection. But you can see our artery coming to view here. And you can see, you know, literally within really minutes, beautiful we're, anatomy. we have the hyaline view. And Jim, obviously, uh, with the retroperitoneal approach, the bulldogs uh, are optimal for a uh, hyalur occlusion. Uh, but in a transperitoneal approach, uh, your thoughts versus Satinsky versus Bulldog? Yeah. Again, other space limitations retroperitoneally. The Satinsky is a, is a, requires some space. And so a good question, but it's very, we haven't really tried it, but I just haven't tried it because there just takes a lot more uh, space to put a Satinsky in. So we've exclusively stayed with the Bulldogs for a retroperitoneal approach. And I like the retroperitoneal approach for patients who've had previous surgery, pretty much all lateral or posterior tumors you know, you, you can do retroperitonealy. Now, a lot of people will do this tumor trans, and I see no problem with that. I, do, I will tell you that in our experience, the patients tend to go home faster uh, because we're not having any bowel manipulation, and they go home about a day sooner in our series. So we've done, uh, I think, 50 of each. And, I've, and in fact, I'd probably do as many trans as I do retro, maybe slightly more retro, but it's all based on tumor location. So um, we're just getting this artery dissected out. Jim, any... Uh any uh, preoperative preparation as far as uh, you gave us the, the demographics and the history on the patient. What about uh, preparation of the patient? Do you do any, you know, some people will bowel prep, some won't. Yeah. Anything we, special that you recommend? Yeah, we, or? yeah we, we bowel prep our transperitoneal patients, but we don't bowel prep the retroperitoneal patients. Um, we just um, feel like we don't need to do that. So artery's about almost done here. I just want to get this backside. There's a little band back here on the backside, but you just want to get enough and I like to use two bulldog clamps. Um, I find that one, unfortunately, is not enough. Uh, it just doesn't give us the full hemostasis we want. Jim, do you think you need to bowel prep your transperitoneal patients? Uh, that's uh, controversial. Yeah, I, I, I just do it to make the colon smaller for the most part because, especially in men, if you let them just do their normal thing, their colons are real big. And it just gives them a way to get their colon a little smaller. That's the only reason I really do it. I don't think it makes a difference. Go ahead, Nance, come off. I don't think it makes a difference as far as their, um, 
as far as their uh, you know post-operative course. So now I'm going to go look for the vein. The vein's going obviously going to be above the cava. So here's cava, and this is this is where you have to stay oriented because people that have that do this surgery will sometimes you know get disoriented and think the vena cava might be the renal vein, and so you really have to kind of find out where things are. So we'll just go back to our landmarks. We had a uh, we had the ureter above, ureter here, kidney here. And we're going to find this vein above the vena cava. Nance, go ahead and come back in. So she's going to hold up for me. And I'm just going to come in here, pull this fat away. I'm going to go real slow here. There's no point in hurrying on the um, hilum. And uh, what's your preference in terms of uh, clamping uh, artery and vein together, artery alone, leaving yeah. the vein open? Great question. Uh, so I, I individualize it based on tumor location again. Um, we tend to just do arteries for most of our patients. We will do veins in patients who have central tumors or large tumors. Yesterday we did a case of having nephrectomy, we clamped the, the vein because there could be some big, big venous back bleeding. In most cases, we can get by without, without clamping the vein, but in this case today, uh, we're going to clamp the, the vein because it's a pretty central tumor. Jim, in your in your experience, do you think not clamping the vein makes a difference from a you know, oxygenation standpoint, considering the partial pressure and of oxygen in uh, in venous uh, blood flow? I really can't answer that, Eric. I, I, we, there's no way we we haven't studied that to know if it makes a difference. Yeah. You know, there, you know, Ari Shellhav has has recently shown some some information that says that maybe keeping the vein open is better. Um, but I, there's no way I've been able to measure that. I, I think it's a more of a practical thing. If we don't need to clamp it, that's the peritoneum right there, actually. So we're going to stay away from the peritoneum. We're a little high there, so the cave is there. Check right here, please. How about the panel? Ben, ben or Mike, uh, Lee, do you guys have a, uh, a preference? I, I, I tend to clamp the artery and vein. I, I want to do everything possible for a bloodless field. Right there, um, and so it's been my, my practice to always clamp both. So uh, I'll, uh, I'll, I agree with, uh, with Jim in that I'll typically put two bulldog clamps on the, uh, on the artery in order to get uh, good opposition. Uh, and I will uh, generally uh, clamp the vein as well. In terms of uh, um, warm, uh, warm Nancy, ischemia, uh, come off, man. There been a, there's been a lot of uh, discussion about early unclamping and essentially uh, having a, uh, a two of uh, run the base and then uh, placing and then unclamping either after the placement of the initial capsular, just the capsular sutures to uh, open up the uh, uh, the clamp at that point. And uh, with that, the ischemia times have really come down to about 19 minutes uh, with that approach. We have Dr. Lee Ming Su who's joined us here now. Uh, what about you, Lee? Do you have a preference? Uh, yeah, I'm not sure it was discussed before I just got in here, but I, I uh, tend to clamp only artery. The ones that I'll clamp both artery and vein are the ones that are closer to the hilum where you're definitely going to get a lot more venous back bleeding. I think for the, the individual starting this, though, they should be prepared to clamp both in the okay. event of, of a significant venous back bleed, okay. uh, but generally speaking, artery only. I think Ari Shaw have, has had some uh, data uh, indicating that the ischemic damage of the kidney is less if you clamp only the artery and not artery and vein. Uh, so it's, it's, it's an adjustment you have to make based on the location of the lesion as well as actually what you see when you begin to resect your lesion. Uh, I, I would make one caveat, which is exactly what you said, which is when you're starting out, you know, the, the, really the, the outcomes on renal function, uh, as long as clamp times are below 30 minutes, are, are equivocal. I don't think anyone's really proven that unclamping, leaving the vein unclamped makes any difference, and, and frankly, times have been debated. And the importance when you're first starting out with this operation is to have a bloodless field so you adequately resect the lesion. Uh, and it's bleeding, I think, that can be a real struggle for people. So I think, as you said, you know, you have to really consider, especially if you're starting out, whether you, you know, you're really going to probably benefit from a bloodless field. Yeah, and that, there's that snowball effect that we've all been in where it is uh, bleeding considerably, either venous or arterial, then your margin status is in question and, you know, the whole operation gets a lot more hairy. Now, in the transperitoneal approach uh, with uh, placing a, a bulldog or a Satinsky, certainly okay. um, uh, I think that uh, having that, uh, that external handle of Satinsky uh, protrude from the patient's concern 
uh, in having collisions with a robotic okay, arm. And so that's always been a, a concern uh, in, in those uh, who have undergone uh, robotic partials uh, uh, using the Satinsky. The Bulldogs, uh, it does require an assistant uh, who is uh, facile at placing and removing. And uh, generally, uh, the Bulldog remover is used actually to place uh, both, uh, to place and remove the, uh, the Bulldog clamp. Lee, any uh, thoughts uh, as to Bulldog versus uh, Stinsky? I was gonna ask you that question, actually, because I know you've had experience with both, and uh, if I remember, you presented some stuff looking diagrammatically of where is the safe zone of placing the, the uh, Stinsky clamp. Uh, so I have not had experience robotically using the Satinsky. I've done it laparoscopically, but I generally use two bulldogs as a safety measure. And I think Rolf Clayman has, has done some nice work looking at the strength of the bulldog clamping mechanism in that the, 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 the crotch, if you will, of that bulldog clamp is much more uh, uh, coaptive, if you will, than the distal end. So I think it's important to skeletonize those vessels and try to get uh, coaptation as close to the crotch of that uh, bulldog as you can. Uh, but Question right back at you, Ben. I mean, what, have you noticed the difference between the two? I, I think the uh, Satinsky uh, um, has a, a more reliable opposition. Uh, I think that during the dissection, uh, where we've seen, it's important to, to dissect the tissue directly uh, posterior uh, prior to uh, clamping the, uh, uh, putting the, placing the clamp in order to get good apposition uh, of the jaws and certainly to test the instruments that they've been assembled correctly. Uh, before uh, before placing it uh, in the patient, the uh, the study that we did looking at the safety zone uh, found that a minimum of at least seven centimeters was needed in order to uh, make sure that the the trocar placed externally is at least okay. uh, seven centimeters away from uh, an adjacent trocar to avoid uh, any collisions. So Jim, you're doing a, a, a beautiful job dissecting out that hilum. Just, uh, it brings to question, do you uh, ever routinely do a lymphadenectomy or do you think there's a role for that for these small lesions or is it based on imaging? Uh, not in, not in uh, renal cell, no, I don't. Not for small lesions like this, I don't. Um, TCC, you know, yes, the nephro use, we always do a no dissection, but for, uh, for this disease, small tumors, uh, we don't do no. no. Mike, what about uh, do you uh, routinely? Right. There's yeah, some people I, I, who brought I, that into question. I've, I've had one patient who had uh, on preoperative imaging had clinical, what appeared to be a clinically positive lymph node. Um, and so on lymph node dissection, it ended up being a retroperitoneal schwannoma. So other than that, I don't have any experience with it. So. Ben or Lee, any? Uh, no, I generally uh, don't routinely perform a, a lymphadenectomy. If there's uh, on preoperative imaging, if the CT scan does demonstrate a uh, um, increased uh, uh, lymph node uh, size, then I'll do the dissection at that point. Can we poll the audience? Uh, how many people in the room currently do uh, robot-assisted radical pro uh, uh, partial nephrectomy? How many people are doing? Okay, so good number. Uh, how many people are doing just laparoscopic, no robotics at all? And, and uh, how many people are doing a, a transperitoneal uh, partial nephrectomy? Uh, what about uh, retroperitoneal? Well, so, so actually pretty evenly, uh, we're still more robotics uh, and uh, obviously more transperitoneal, but a surprising higher number than I thought I would for retroperitoneal. retroperitoneal so. Now, Jim, when you first started with partial nephrectomy, did you start off? retroperitoneal when you were doing lap and then went to robotics? Uh, yes. What was it that drew you to the retroperitoneal approach? Yeah, we started, we started doing uh, retroperitoneal laparoscopically and that, that helped, you know, that helped set us up for robotics. It's not something I would probably do with a robot unless you've done some, you know, uh, with, with another, another procedure, you know, like a laparoscopic approach. So I think we're going to, we're going to call that our vein. It looks a little smaller, maybe another branch here. I can't really tell. But it, it, it also could be the vena cava going up, so I think we're okay there. I'm going to do a little bit more right there. I don't want to dig too far here. Nance right there, please. Uh -huh. If there are any questions from the audience, you can come up to the microphone and we can uh, certainly relay them to Dr. Porter. Yeah. 
So uh, for those who came in late, this is a retroperitoneal approach on a patient with a 2.5 uh, centimeter solid endophytic mid-pole mass. And uh, Dr. Porter has uh, uh, now dissected out the uh, hilum. There's a single renal artery, single renal artery, single renal vein. So Jim, we, we, we've heard your, uh, your routine that uh, as far as prepping the patient, uh, it sounds uh, like you asked for the mannitol. Do you have a set routine for that as far as how many times you give mannitol or any other diuretics or yeah, I, I used to just anything for the audience that they should okay. um, And right around the time that I'm the second off the hilum, um, just because I know I'm, it's, just a, it's a reminder to me that I'm, I'm messing with the vessels. So I just give it usually here. I know some people talk about giving it uh, after the, um, uh, after they take the plants off to maybe scavenge free radical. Um, but I don't know if that makes a difference or not. So it looks like I've got another vein here. So that's the top of the cave over here. Can you see that, uh, Eric? Yes. Yep. So that's looks the top great. of the cave. That's what I was looks like it bifurcates. It, it's yeah. an early bifurcation right there. Right. It, there truly is. So we're going to have to, you know, do a little more dissection here. We're going to take our time. That's the, that's the other part of the renal vein. And, um, you yeah, know, we'll just take our time. From the panel here, uh, anybody use anything different other than one dose of mannitol, or I tend to do I tend to do a dose before and after. I uh, tend to give uh, 12.5 of uh, mannitol and also 10 of Lasix. And uh, Jim, I'm curious to uh, hear whether or not in patients with a solitary kidney that you're doing a partial nephrectomy on, do you do anything different uh, in terms of uh, managing the ischemia? Well, I. Um we just did actually one with a solitary kidney not too long ago, and I tried to come off clamp early, but it's actually an interesting case. We, we had a arterial um, ble bleeding, even though we had the vessels clamped, and so we just kind of persevered, and got it done. But in general, I try and you know limit how much we clamp, you know how much time we clamp. It's hard to do sometimes. This was a very exophytic lesion we were we were dealing with, um, but nothing. I don't. I haven't. I've done probably three total of solitary kidneys this way. We, we, in, in, in thinking about the issue of uh, cold ischemia for robotic partial nephrectomy, uh, as opposed to the warm ischemia having protection with uh, creating osmotic diuresis uh, with the mannitol, uh, in our series at Tulane of uh, solitary kidneys, that uh, patients with solitary kidneys who have undergone robotic partials, we've been trying to think of ways to approach uh, for uh, cold, generating cold so, ischemia uh, time. We're going to go and long, so, we're going to go long on the vein, okay? Long clamp on the vein. We're going to try and get both veins in the, in the single clamp, okay? Sorry about that. I had to talk to Nancy. Sorry about that. No, that's, that's fine. So, uh, you know, there's been a lot of uh, uh, work uh, to look okay, at whether okay. or not one can generate cold ischemia uh, using an ice flush uh, model. but. It's difficult to get the slurry particles fine enough to get through the 12 millimeter trocar and then to extract them uh, in a timely fashion. Uh, people have looked at um, using cold irrigation uh, to uh, cool uh, through the um, irrigator aspirator, uh, but the runoff is always a concern uh, yeah, on yeah. the bowel. Uh, and we've, uh, we've looked to do a retrograde fashion um, to essentially place up a, a dual lumen catheter and irrigate ice cold saline and uh, we've been able to get temperatures down to about 20 degrees Celsius to uh, perform uh, an adjunct in those uh, special, not as a routine procedure, but in kidneys, even with uh, T1B lesions, to uh, uh, undergo uh, uh, protective effect during uh, robotic partial infection. Now, Ben, are you doing that routinely, or is this uh, only for solitary kidneys? Only for solitary kidneys. Yeah, because I think that's, that's Jamie Lanwin's work, right, initially. That was yeah, Jamie well. had used a, a ureteral access. Yeah, uh, yeah. He had done a lot of early work using a ureteral access sheath with a, uh, a double J stent. Uh, we've been using just a dual lumen catheter, and it found that that's uh, been effective. Not, not to sound like the conservative uh, old man up here, but I, you know, I, I guess I, I'm a bit concerned about patients that come in with renal insufficiency or solitary kidneys, and I'd love to hear uh, Alex Motri's thought and Sam's later on regarding uh, robotic partial in those settings. Uh, there is some data, and, and this is Indy Gill studies, looking at patients with pre-existing renal insufficiency noting higher complication rates and higher percentage of patients requiring 
perioperative dialysis in that patient population. So I have to say, I have not gone that direction uh, with patients that have solitary kidneys and generally have had those, those cases done open. But, uh, you know, I, I obviously could probably be proven wrong by some of the data that hopefully the experts will show, share with us later. Jim, do you have any uh, uh, advice? As, you know, I, I would say that some people run into the problem of not being able to find the tumor, especially an endophytic one like yours. Yeah. So a couple questions. One would yeah. be, do you use ultrasound? And if so, do you think you should use it all the time? And the second question would be, any tips? You know, uh, one of the comments that's often made to trainees is, you know, the tumors are a lot higher and more lateral than you realize uh, based on the imaging. And uh, people have found themselves in scenarios, I myself included, where I'm convinced I found the tumor, and in fact, it was not the tumor. You know, it was normal kidney. Yeah. So uh, how do you address that? Well, uh, I like ultrasound. Well, I use it uh, every I case. I use it the case. cases I don't need it I for case the cases I that I do need it. And today, I'm definitely going to need ultrasound. This whole case will be directed by ultrasound because of the endophytic nature of the tumor. So I'm a big fan of ultrasound. Um, you know, it, it's easy to get disoriented sometimes, but for example, right now, if I didn't know where I was, I'd put ultrasound right on the kidney right now, and we could localize the tumor. Let's do that anyway, Nance. Let's get ultrasound ready. But you could put ultrasound on the kidney right now and start looking for the tumor before you even start your dissection to guide your dissection, and I do that in certain cases. I have a pretty good idea where this tumor is. It's going to be right up here, but we're going to put ultrasound on it and just show you that. And I think it's a really nice guide, but again, you need a very good assistant. You need somebody that knows how to use the ultrasound. And we're going to go to Tile Pro. Steve, can I get the um, wireless mic? I mean the wireless. Okay, so what we have, I don't know if you guys can see the Tile, Tile Pro image. Yeah, we see it. Okay, so Nance, let's go back and forth. Oh, there it is. There's a tumor, Nance. There it is. Go up, go up. Right there, right there. Do you see the tumor there? Yep. Okay. Steve, get, make sure Nancy can see it, please. Push forward, Nance. Push forward. Good. Right, right here, Nance. Right here. And I think, you know, this demonstrates the importance of the ultrasound. I think a lot of yeah. people looking at the original yeah. place you were looking with that ultrasound would have thought that was the tumor. Yeah. No, uh, tumor and right uh, this really highlights. Very bright tumor. Okay, come on. How much? Here. Yep. So we have the capability with Tile Pro. We can go through our our X-ray images. I can do that. From the field here, you can see I'm I'm actually scrolling right at the console. I got a wireless mouse, and I can go back and forth with the image on the left-hand side and see the tumor. I can go to coronal. I can go to the angiogram. Here's the late images. There's the delayed view. There's the tumor. You can see we're close to collecting system, and we'll go to the next. I think the next one's a coronal. I'm doing this off from the console thanks to Tile Pro. It's a really nice feature. Really helps you see things real time. Where is the sagittal? And then we've got our, our vascular phase here. You're off the tile pro. We just lost tile pro. I'm off tile pro. What happened? Yes. I don't know. Steve. Steve, come on. Okay. You guys have it yet? Back up. Yep, we got yeah. it now. All right, so here's our re here's our reconstruction. You can see the tumor kind of very close. That's the right that's the right kidney in the front there. So uh, we like ultrasound. That's the answer to the question. Okay, we're gonna go off tile pro. How many people here in the audience doing robotic uh, partial nephrectomy are using ultrasound in every case that they do? How about some of the cases? Um, it seems the majority use it selectively, but so I think it's good, Eric, to do it when you're not, you know, when you don't need it, because you're going to need it in certain cases. There's a tumor yeah. right there, and it's um, it's a skill. I mean, it's, it takes a time, some time for yeah. your assistant to become facile with it. Uh, Jim, any any thoughts on you know I, I, and and. There's debate as to whether there's value on it. You know, with the ultrasound, you can identify the lesion early. Uh, you know, I see a lot of people who expose the surface of the kidney. Do you think there's any value in leaving the fat on the tumor, or do you send it separately? Well, I tend to send it separately. To identify I'm, whether something is T3. Yeah, I send it separately separately if, if I can leave it on. Um, if, I'm, if I'm worried about it, I will. And in this case, 
you know, there's really no fat in this woman here. This is all, that's the tumor surface right there. So there's not much there. That's actually peritoneum right there, okay? So we don't have a lot here, which it kind of brings me to the point. When I was doing my dissection, my initial dissection, I didn't say much about it, but the key is, is to stay inside this cut edge of gerotis. That's how you stay out of the peritoneum. So I, I, find, I know where that landmark is, and then I stayed right on the kidney in order to get, get myself right, right on the tumor. In this case, there's just not a hey, lot Jim, here. Any, any, any worries about that little, little kind of nodule-looking thing to the right? I saw that. I'm not uh, sure if that's a nodule or if that's a cyst. It looks like a cyst to me. We can, uh, looks cystic. Okay. We can play that. We can play with that later if we want. So I'm just going to rotate this kidney towards us. Peritoneum is very close here, so I just got to stay out of it. She's not, she's not very obese. Here and here. And Jim, uh, in terms of uh, instrument selection, uh, any comments in terms of, uh, in the left hand, uh, in terms of using the uh, the, bipo the fenestrated bipolar versus the Maryland bipolar versus the Prograst, yeah. and why you decided to go with uh, what you what you yeah. use in your left hand? Yeah, the fenestrated, I like it because it's rounded, it's a great retractor, and it's, it's, it's atraumatic. With, with the Maryland, it's, it's pretty pokey. I like the Maryland for the prostate because I like the way it dissects, but when I'm doing kidney work and I'm using my left hand a lot for retraction in the hilum or on the kidney itself, I really like this rounded, uh, you know, fenestrated bipolar. It gives me a lot better surface and I'm a lot less traumatic with it. Jim, you know, because you're retroperitoneal, do you ever use forearms in this or is generally because of the lack of room only a three-arm technique? Yeah, it's, it's really just a three-arm technique because of the space uh, gleaming. Uh, it's... it's um, I like the fourth arm for trans, but there's just not enough space for it here. And as you can see, you know, I'm not sure what we'll do with it right now. Um, we've got pretty much everything we need in our face. So, you know, we're not retracting the bowel. We don't have things to retract so much. So the use in the, in the retroperitoneum, I think, would be limited. So what would happen if you get into the peritoneum right now? I mean, you know, uh, people talk about converting to a transperitoneal approach. Does it change much, or what has happened if, when you did get into the peritoneum and you get peritoneal in, in yeah. inflation? Well, I, I, get, I get kind of upset. I, I, I cry, usually, um, because it, it does change <laughs> the case. Um, and so if I got in the peritoneum right here, carbon dioxide would rush into the uh, peritoneal space and press and compress my space. Now. It wouldn't make the case, case impossible, but it would make it more difficult. Um, but now, look at, you know, we have a giant cavern in here. I mean, look at the space we have in here. I mean, I know people say there's no space retrofit nearly, but, you know, we've got a giant space to work in. So, and that's all because I've kept that, that space intact. But are there tricks that you use to get out of that problem if you do get into the perineum? Is there, well, do you sew the hole up, or no, what do you, I've tried, you end up putting another trocar for elevate? I've done sewing the hole. It, it tends not to make a big difference. I will put in, sometimes I'll have my assistant put a trocar right here, right above, near the tip of the 11th rib, and that can actually be used to hold the space open like that, and that can give me more space. So I'm going to I'm gonna shave this. This is kind of the move you have to be careful of, because the peritoneal reflection is pretty close. The peritoneum is right here. You've got to be careful. But I'm going to shave this off a little bit so we have more of a space here, okay? So this is, a, this is the cut edge of the again. I'm just going to come in real gingerly here and hopefully not make a hole. It's just going to give me a little space suck, Nancy. Fortunately, this woman's really thin, and we don't have to do a lot of what I call fat management. There's a lot of fat management that takes place retroperitoneally sometimes. That's going to give us plenty of space to see our case. Okay, let's have ultrasound back in, please. So now we're going to spend a lot of time ultrasounding. Let's 
Reptile Pro. Yeah, got it. So now we're really going to start planning our, our, our resection. And we're going to use the ultrasound probe to do that. So we have right in the center of the tumor, right on top. And let's go, let's go cephalad caudad with our, our mark. So first of all, Nance, come off the tumor. Nance, tu uh, let's suck the smoke first. Let's, let's clear off the field. And then I'm going to show you on the ultrasound probe what we use as landmarks to help guide our, our, our removal here. Because this is, this is a deep tumor. And my, my feeling on these endophytic tumors is you need to go deep and wide. So Nance, rotate it towards them so they can see the black part. So you see these black marks here? This actually represents the edge of the ultrasound um, view, the edge of the ultrasound itself. So one there, and then one on the very end. And we're going to use those to help guide our, our marks that we're going to place for our, our margin of resection. Okay, Nance. So let's go cephalid caudad first. So she's going to push all the way until we see, okay, pull back a little bit. Tumor's going away. Slow down, Nance. Slow down. Push, go push forward, push forward, push forward. Right? Get to the edge of it. Right there. Stop. Slow down. Just, just stay right on top. Just stay right on top. We're just going to make our mark out here first. Push forward, please. Push forward. Push forward. Stay right there. So you can see it's pretty wide. So we're going to we're going to make our mark out here. That's the edge of the black right there. I'm going to use that and make a make a mark out here. Okay, let's go caught at. Let's go to the back of the caudal plane. You're going to have to deflect up. Yeah. I want you flat on the kidney, please. And bring the tip back now. Bring the tip back. Straight back. Straight back. Straight back. Straight back. Stop right there. Okay, so now, Nance, rotate up towards me. So I'm going to give us a little margin here. Pull away. Pull away. I'm going to give ourselves a little, little wider margin here. What's the rate here of a breathing? Yeah, I know. Okay. Okay, let's go side to side to side. Yeah, let's get flat on the tumor, please. I need the whole thing on the surface. No, deflect your wrist up. Yeah, I think it's very key what he's talking to his assistant about because, uh, you know, if you're working with a junior resident, they don't know the deflection angles of that particular device you don't get a clear okay, picture back, of the back. tumor margin there, so that's very right, important right. what he's highlighting there. right okay, now. Lift up, please. Lift up. I'm going to go a little wider than you would think. I mean, I, this tumor is deep, so we're going to have to have a little wider margin in order to get it out completely. That's it, man. Get that down. Get right there. Take them off. Okay, let's suck smoke. Well, you we can see really the benefit of uh, the retroperitoneal approach in, in having this tumor uh, right there, optimized uh, position. If this were a transperitoneal approach, one could put a, a, a baby lap uh, to help push that kidney, uh, 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 push that kidney forward. Uh, but also, you can see how Dr. Porter has right. mobilized all of Dorota's. Uh, off the kidney in order to okay. allow the, the optimal exposure and okay. presentation so that when he does reconstruct uh, the capsule, that it's, it's, it's all presented there. right there in front of him. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting, this tumor's um, right here. It's actually on the side. So this, there's not a lot of distance between here and tumor. Put the ultrasound right there. Push forward in. And then actually go up towards the top, towards the top. Towards the top. Pull back towards you. Pull back towards you. Mm -hmm. Okay, come off, man. We're actually going to excise. It's going to be, we're going to probably take some of this lateral border of the kidney off when we do our excision. Jim, just for our benefit, can you do so? Can you put the probe on that small little bump there? Sure we can. See that ball right there, Nance? Get, get, get flat, yep. Okay. 
Come off, man. You see it? So I can, I'm going to excise that if you want. Okay, I'm going to bring that out with the, with the specimen. I can come around that. I mean, I'm going to have to be this low probably to get this tumor out. The tumor is right here, and it actually extends this way. So I'm going to be coming like this. So we'll, we can excise that out if you if you're out. It, it doesn't look cystic on the ultrasound. Just just do it again, man. One second, let me get you some countertraction here. Okay. No, no, that's deep in the kidney. We gotta be right on the surface of where it is. Let's uh, let's 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 try and see through the other side. Bring your old probe over here, man. We'll, we'll, look, we'll look through the kidney and see if we can see it. It's going to be challenging to see that. But I need you on the back side over here, Nance. Yep. So, Jim, do you lose very much right now if you pick it up and just cut it out without clamping right now, that little tiny thing, no. and send I it mean, off? I probably don't lose anything at all, but I, you know, it looks like it's cystic. It looks like I could just cauterize it, really. Oh, okay. But I'm going to be making my mark. Let's look down here again. Let's make our mark down here. So this is tumor. Tumor, tumor is right here. Okay. I need you all to come there. So Lee, any thoughts uh, in performing a robotic partial nephrectomy off clamp with uh, no ischemia time? Go straight down, please. I think it can be done, but just only in extreme select cases, uh, you know, the, the most exophytic lesions, but also based on skill set and just experience. But I generally plant in all of them, uh, except for the, the ones that are just begging and falling off. Have you, uh, how, okay, what so have you guys been doing? Thing. Yeah, no, we, we uh, will uh, routinely clamp. Uh, there's been uh, some thought uh, as to using adjunct models like the Habib uh, radio frequency device in order to achieve a deep margin of hemostasis. But really, well, the only ones that would be eligible are those with uh, a, a less than uh, five millimeter penetration uh, in the cortex, the, only the most exophytic lesions. So uh, actually it'll be presented a little bit later. Um, we actually have experience with off-clamp, uh, actually deep lesions that are renal sinus, they're almost kind of growing out from the sinus and out through the hilum. Uh, and uh, those oftentimes uh, have isolated vessels you can identify and they almost nucleate out of the kidney. And we were able to do those pretty consistently rather than cutting through the parenchyma. Um, but I think, you know, if you're ready to clamp, if you have the vessels open and ready, you can put a clamp on at any time if you need to. And then, Eric, uh, for hilar lesions, uh, what do you look for uh, preoperatively uh, on the CT scan in order to determine whether or not uh, it is amenable to a, to a partial, uh, um, such as a fat plane uh, along the, uh, the main renal artery or, uh, or a vein? And do you use the uh, nephrometry score to help uh, um, stage those uh, at all? No, I don't use the nephrometry score. I could, probably couldn't even quote it back to you how to measure that. Um, but I, I do tell you that we, we base on just, you know, just hints yeah. of what you see on the CT again, scan yeah. and, and, and you go into the case with an idea of what you want to make happen. And ultimately, going in there and, and dissecting it out and seeing if it nucleates out, if it's something that you were thinking you're going to do a radical nephrectomy on, the patient's consented regarding that. Uh, and if it's someone who needs a partial nephrectomy, they know that they might get an open if you think you can't accomplish it microscopic. Because obviously, renal preservation is the most important thing, not an incision. So, yeah. Uh, he won't be able to he hear you, Sam, but we can relate to it. No, I'm good. Okay. Push forward, Neil. Push down. So Jim, uh, Sam Bayani just made some comments about the lesion and its appearance on sonogram. Any concern this may be an AML because of the bright appearance on sonography? Was there any uh, fat density on that CT? No, there was no fat on CT. No, there was no fat on CT. What does Sam think I should do? We have another question from the audience. Hold on, Jim. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think as with anything that you're starting off, if you're experienced, you know, if you're, if you're early on the learning curve, 
exactly what you said. You have what your your fail safe or your fallback is going to be, which is an open set, a knife, and you know your retractor of choice. Uh, and uh, you know, I, 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 which will be talked about later. There's enormous value in just doing an open partial if you really think someone needs a partial nephrectomy and not let let the approach dictate what you're going to end up being able to offer them. At least that would be our kind of preference. Mike, um, just on on that comment. Um, when, when, when I started at Loyola, the nursing staff was consistently opening a lot of extra instruments for all robotic cases, and we uh, looked at that and had them just minimize that to just the absolute bare necessities, and it just helped with our turnover time. Um, it's something to consider with your, your we're hospital gonna, staff. We're going to bag you guys, okay? We're going to bag very quickly, short term, push it off, okay? Okay, I think we've done enough um, thinking. Check the vein out again, yeah. Jim, do you tend to do anything routinely to evaluate your margins? Um, we, we take it out at the end of the case and look at it and make sure we're, we're adequate. Now, that's obviously a little after the fact, but uh, we haven't had any issues, and mainly because I'm trying, you know, this tumor like this is going to be obviously a little more concerning because it's deep, but we do look at them to make sure we've got an adequate margin, and then we talk to the patient if we don't, but we've only had that happen, I think, twice now both early in our experience. So um, I, I don't I don't take a you know a, a piece of tissue because I don't think it makes any difference. It depends on where you take the tissue from. Let's not smoke me. I don't think that makes any difference. We did at one time we were extracting our specimens during one ischemia time and we were looking at that and it actually added about ninety seconds to sometimes 120 seconds to extract and reestablish neoperitoneum. And we did it because we were concerned about the margin. And what we determined was that our margins were, in general, good, and so we stopped that practice. Got some more answers, so. I don't know, Pat is not here, so we're, we're going to do it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yep. Yeah, he did that at the beginning. We can do that again. Uh, Jim, uh, a request from the audience. Would you mind uh, just quickly uh, uh, do a picture in picture to show where your ports are placed? I don't know if you still have a camera. Over that, get the some people were requesting. The Just for a few few okay. moments. Yes, yeah, hold up here, please. So, so going back, back to your comment, though, Ben, you know it's interesting. Uh, uh, or I, I don't know if it was Lee, really, maybe who said this, but I think the data has held out that obtaining frozen sections at the time of a robot or laparoscopic partial nephrectomy has little to no value. And in fact, the people who have commented on going back and taking a kidney out have universally found no residual tumor. They ended up taking a kidney out unnecessarily. So, uh, you know, people, some purists will insist that you have to get margins and that makes a difference in what you do operatively. But the vast majority of people who do, unless someone else has some other experience, would argue that they started off with margins and then now have ceased doing that. I don't know if you all have a different opinion up here or from the audience. So we've got the image there, Jim. Looks great. Okay. Yeah, I'll be right there. Yeah. So, right for those who uh, who came in uh, later, it's a retroperitoneal approach. Uh, there's a, a it's a three arm technique, and then a fourth trocar, 12 millimeter trocar to pass instruments. Uh, with the retroperitoneal approach, the the robot is docked over uh, over the head, uh, as opposed to the transperitoneal approach where it comes in uh, uh, from the back. You have a question? Um, I mean, my my argument would be no, and the reason is that I don't know that you could get adequate tissue sampling. I think if you feel very confident it's an AML, you wouldn't be here in the first place. Um, if you got a frozen of it, you know, you, how would you do it? Would you cut it open? Would you do a, a, a biopsy needle? Uh, the biopsy needle may not be diagnostic. If you cut it open and it ends up being a, an RCC and you end up exposing that to the retroperitoneum, was that really the right thing to do? I think, I mean, at least for me, I think you're either committed at this point or you're not. The way, I mean, the way I yeah, see it, I'm not yeah. sure. If there, I, I don't know a frozen section here that would change what I did in this, in the, at this moment. Uh, any 
Yeah, I, I tend to agree with you, Eric. I, and if it wasn't AML, I wouldn't stop. I would still treat her at this point. And I think the fact that uh, the preoperative CT scan uh, really didn't look like it had negative Helmsfield units, uh, and I would uh, uh, proceed at this point. Well, the counter argument is that is those lesions less than four centimeters, 30 to 40 percent, are benign based on some literature that's out there. So I think that the concept of a biopsy is coming around. At our institution, we have not routinely done that, but I think it's something that we all as a field need to reinvestigate if we are operating on 30 to 40 percent of patients that probably don't need that surgery. So. Well, and I think also deciding that preoperatively. I mean, you know, here you're already right, here. Right. You know, it'd be different yeah. if you. So you can see how uh, Dr. Porter's, uh, it's a, a nice uh, a nice resection, how uh, he's, he's aiming his scissors down uh, so that the, the, because the ultrasound localization, localization is demonstrated, uh, the depth of penetration, so he needs to go down deep enough before coming across the base. So uh, he's doing a very nice job. And also you can see that the, the assistant uh, occasionally is uh, um, sucking in the crevice and, and the runoff in order to help uh, oh, keep yeah, exposure uh, maximized. No, we didn't do, uh, and I don't know, Jim, let us know if we're uh, interrupting you here during your clamp time. But uh, uh, some people would use indigo carmine or some sort of uh, technique to identify the collecting system. Is that? Been the experience here of the panelists or Jim? I don't know if you have an op if you feel comfortable answering that question right now. Um, we see the collecting system very well with the robot. Laparoscopically, we had to use them to go farming, but with the robot, we can see things very well. How about up here? Anybody routinely use it? That's it, man. Uh, I don't tend to use anything. Man, no, I think that you can visualize uh, um, pretty well without uh, use of routine use of uh, indigo farming. Yeah, I usually don't, but for the deeper ones that on CT appear to be approximating the, the collecting system, I think there's little risk to giving it, and if it gives you an extra visual measure that you've reached your collecting system in the proper depth of your resection, I think it doesn't hurt, but not for the uh, superficial ones. Alex or Sam, I, I invite you to come to the, give us comments if you think there's anything else that needs to be added or discussed that might be worthwhile. Well, you definitely picked a, a, a good case, uh, Jim. A lot of people uh, would have picked a, a little bit more of a chip shot case, so that definitely shows what what, what can well, be done, robot. I had no choice, actually. I, I had no choice, actually. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this is what came up, and I was right here, man. Yeah. Okay, Darren. Right. Let's bag it. So, Jim, we had uh, Alex Mutra here just uh, commenting on uh, your excellent resection here and, and pointing out that he agrees with you about uh, the lack of need for any sort of uh, intravenous uh, dye that would, uh, or agent that would ha allow you to identify the collecting system. Nice resection. That was, okay, let's have I think that took time. you all of about four or five minutes at best. Four what's minutes, huh, is what the, we got the audience for. All right, John. All right, John. So we're going to go with 4 Terry. So we're going to go with 4 Terry. So I'm going to look for some individual vessels. Please. Pretty good. There's a vessel right there. From the panel, do you all uh, routinely uh, oversew individual vessels or just let the uh, compression of the renal orifice uh, manage this? 
I generally baseball stitch that whole uh, deep resection site. Uh, you know, I'm just curious, Jim, you know, I noticed you're not using a lapper tie on that and you're tying that knot. I mean, yeah. any thoughts, you know, or? Um, it doesn't take a lot of time to do these vessels and I think it just makes it a little more hemostatic. Come on, guys. No way, is it? I see it. Yeah, I I tend to just, um, similar to what Ali mentioned, I just will run a suture on the base and I started just using a pre-placed clip and I'll run it from outside the capsule, bring it into my defect and then run the base. And the the right. I just use a hemolock, I don't use any laparotides. But you keep the hemolock outside of outside the Outside of the right. Yeah. And then I finish it, I just come, when I'm done running my base, I bring it out of the defect, through the defect and out to the capsule and place a second hemolock and then that can slide down just to create the tension that you want. Do you worry about pseudoaneurysms? You know, I, 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 every time I see someone running their base sutures, it's kind of this uh, indiscriminate throw running down the base rather than where, where here Jim is actually identifying the actual lumens. Uh, you, you know, pseudoaneurysms are a concern with needles running through uh, deep uh, vessels. Has that been a concern for you all? And, and I guess the other question is when you didn't run the base, did yeah. you have more hemorrhage? Yeah, I, I, uh, I personally, uh, in my series, uh, when we went to uh, the robotic approach and also the uh, the running using the two of Vicryl, the base of the lesion, I think it starts to, it, it does two things. At once, it, it closes that defect, closes any collecting okay. system, but also starts to bring the capsule together. Okay, have cap and the number of, uh, the percentage of pseudoaneurysms has gone down uh, okay. compared to the laparoscopic <laughs> approach. Now one can see also on these needle drivers, there's um, a scissors at the at the base of it. So uh, he's not he's not tearing the suture. He's essentially using the scissors at the very base of that needle driver to cut a stitch, and that uh, helps in the economy of motion. Now the decision at this point is whether to close transversely um, or uh, perpendicular to that. You can see it's a really a, a up to the uh, how it lies uh, to bring those edges together. What size needle do you use there, Jim? What, tell us what your, uh, what your uh, suture of choice and needle of choice is. This is a 3 0 Caperson. This is a 3 0 Caperson. And it's on a V20 needle. And it's on a V20 needle. You can see that it's been uh, preloaded with, uh, with a hemolock and a lapper tie uh, in order to. Uh, help uh, with that uh, uh, renorophy. The question to the other panel members, do you guys use any sort of energy uh, to treat the base after your resection? I do. I mean, I use monopolar or um, argon beam on the cortical edge. You probably don't have to on a lot of the superficial ones. Uh, I did, this is just more belt and suspenders, so I feel more comfortable that I can sleep at night, but you know, I, I, I don't know, uh, I, you know, it hasn't been clearly studied very well, but I, I do on the cortical edge. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, that's good, we're good. You can see how that uh, yeah, stitch good. now at the base starts bringing that right. the base of the uh, uh, of the kidney together, and really uh, it's nice to it, it, and demonstrates the skill uh, that uh, uh, that's seen here to place the suture and tighten it without tearing through uh, the parenchyma. You know, uh, a lot of people have gone to this running the base. I will tell you that myself and some of my colleagues, we we would probably exclude this step and just do the renorphy. Um, I don't know. I, I, I remember, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, a lot of this stemmed from the lap, pure lab literature and techniques that were demonstrated at various endurological meetings 
when there were some hemorrhage rates with the pure lab approach. And uh, I don't know if this, if this, well, this is presumably for you guys who all seems like everybody seems to use this okay. technique. Double arm. Do you think this lowers the rate of hemorrhage or? I don't know. Eric, for me, I mean, I just think, think that you have to ligate those deep vessels somehow, whether it's individual ligation like he did or just a baseball stitch. I haven't seen this combination of what he's doing before. It's a nice uh, closure, but um, I, I don't think we, back to the pseudoaneurysm comment, I know that Indy Gill's very first series, the comment was the needles going into the parenchyma causing pseudoaneurysms. I don't think we really know why. I think the main reason that's probably occurring is if you just have a bad hemostatic closure and you are not getting the vessels very well, whether it's individual ligation of vessels or a deep running layer. You just have to get it in some fashion. Uh, and, uh, you know, and perhaps that parenchymal closure that he's doing right now, the parenchymal apposition is, uh, is, 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 you know, uh, as important as anything else. So you can see that you, you, in that initial stitch alone, uh, about 50% of that defect was closed. Now with the capsular sutures uh, being placed, uh, that'll uh, continue to close that defect. Question from the audience. I haven't, uh, you know, I, I know there are uh, a group of about three or four people that have some experience with this, and they're using the Habib around the margin of the tumor and then resecting the lesion without clamping. Um, I think it's a neat concept, but I think we're turning a very expensive operation to even more of an expensive operation. And uh, I think there's concern also of the thermal damage and uh, perhaps charring that margin, making it more uh, difficult to discern your, your adequacy of your resection. Uh, but in saying that, I have not had uh, any uh, direct experience with that myself. Anyone else on the panel? I've never used the Habib. We had looked at the Habib, and one of the factors uh, in, in using the Habib uh, is that it may distort the ability to, for the pathologist to right. render an accurate uh, uh, pathologic diagnosis because of the char uh, that's resultant uh, in, the, uh, in the Habib machine. Now, Jim, you've got a, a beautiful closure here at position. Uh, I think some, one question is uh, there are some people who use hemostatic agents in there, such as uh, hemostatic matrices, such as flow seal and surgic flow, and then also the fibrin glues. Do you use any of those in conjunction with the renorphine? Um, uh, I'll tell you that later. Okay. So, Jim, at what point would you uh, make the decision to go ahead and, uh, and unclamp uh, your artery? Pretty soon. Pretty soon. I don't, I'm not trying to be trite or anything. Right. Right. I'm just, I just want to get this, this just, last couple of stitches in, and then I'll, uh, we'll, we'll probably take the clamps off. So you can see also the, um, the, the hemolock slips and sliding. One can gauge the, uh, the tension on the, on the suture by looking at essentially at a, a little dimple uh, on, the, uh, uh, on the kidney. And one can gauge whether or not uh, there's going to be any fracturing uh, with excessive force. Uh, uh, and this is a nice demonstration of how uh, they can just lie. You can slide down and, and, and get an excellent apposition of the tissue. Your time, John. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Bulldog remover. Bulldog remover. Vein first. This operation really illustrates the importance of the assistant. So nice and slow, man. So 15 minute uh, warm ischemia time, really a, a wonderful demonstration of the technique. That's fantastic, Jim. Excellent. So, J Jim, I have a question for you. On the last uh, stitch you threw there, why did you choose to use a 
uh, separate suture opposed to the one you already had uh, placed? Well, um, because I was going to have to go back the opposite way, and it was going to be hard for my assistant to get the um, the hemolock over here on this side. It's going to be a little more challenging, so I actually threw it towards myself. Um, actually, something I learned from Sam. So he, he uses symbols the whole time, and he uses them because I think it's it's challenging to um, to, to put a hemolock on this side and then create the tension you need to. You can do it, but it's much harder on this back side. Great, thanks. Okay, Chuck, please. Yes. Rapid time, please. Good. Certainly, I think that's a consideration, and I think it all comes down to what surgeon preference is. You know, it ranges from someone not clamping to clamping five minutes to two, and so, I mean, your point is well taken. There's, there's no doubt that I, and I think that's why Ben, you know, asked the question. But ultimately, I think, you know, 15, 10 minutes, okay. 20 minutes, 17 minutes, okay. no one's shown a single bit of difference, short term or long term, anything under 30 minutes. So uh, I think if you can do it, then it's, I mean, if you can do two minutes, that's ideal. But ultimately, it's going to be what you're comfortable with, hemorrhage-wise and all that. But yes, that I, I would imagine you could have taken it off. I don't know what your panel spots are. With his ischemia time of only 15 minutes, I, I would have just completed the repair. It was so quick, um, opposed to stopping the and taking the, the clamps off. If I had, if I had concern and my time was higher, then I think I would, that's reason why I personally don't have any experience with early unclamping. But. So we're just reinforcing these clamps with uh, Rapportize, just to make sure they don't slide. And we will put flow seal over the top of this. I mean, somebody asked about the agent. Um, I put it on the outside. I don't know what, if it makes any difference or not. Um, you know, the one study that's been published, there was a difference, but it wasn't specifically a significant difference. Um, so I, I use it mainly because it's a habit we have it available i'm not sure it does anything but we put it on the outside so let's if, if you guys don't mind what time do we have we've got some time we can we're going to extract uh, actually no, we're just going to put some floaty on here and we'll let you guys go i guess uh, any other questions let's get this out of here Nance. Let's check no it's a beautiful case beautiful case jim uh how do you manage your uh partial nephrectomies post-operatively um, we um, usually take the catheter out the next day in the morning, the Foley catheter out. We, we we're going to leave a drain in. We take out the drain if, there's, if the output is reasonable and low. And um, if everything looks good, they can go home. Usually the, some of our retros go home the next day. Some will stay till day two. Our average time is 2.2 days with the retros. And it's, it's three days. Average time is three days with trans. But uh, again, that varies from patient to patient. Um, what what know, makes it longer for transparent new? Uh, you know, I for you, I mean, is I don't it? Think bowels wake up as quickly. I just think they have a little more of an alias, especially the left-sided cases. But um, um, you know, I, I I don't know why, but we just seem to have a little faster recovery with the uh, with the retros. Do you do you uh, when you do radical nephrectomies? Do they go home the next day? No, not usually. Some do, uh, but but not usually. We got a little bit here, man. Let's check it out. Mm -hmm. 
right down here at the base of this thing. Do you have a small uh, metal clip here? Yeah. Yeah, I will. So, um, let's see. Yeah, if I need this below me just with the tip, it's coming right from here. It's not a big deal. There we are. We pull back a little bit. Right there. Good. Good. That's precision. Um, I don't know if you guys noticed, but I, I'm using the super cut needle driver, and uh, I started using this about. Uh, well, I use it for my prostates when I suture, and I started using it on the prostates, and I like it because it saves having the assistant come in and uh, cut, so it saves us some time. It, there is a learning curve with it, however, and you can cut sutures inadvertently, so you have to be aware that it's in your, in your right hand, and if the suture gets in that little jaw, you can inadvertently cut it. So I, I like it. I think it saves time with the partial. Uh, but I would start on your prostates and get used to it. But I think it's um, it's a good instrument. Now, Jim, you have kind of a cigarette roll of uh, Surgicel up there. Were you were you putting that in as a just in case, or do you sometimes use yeah, it, or what's um, your criteria for using it? it? I, I use it mainly if I get more bleeding than I like during the resection, and I can just tamponade and, and resect. I've had to do that a couple times, and kind of poor uh, poor poor vascular control. So I put it in kind of as a safety, but I, I we, we rarely use the bolster anymore. Uh, we do for hemineprectomies, but other than that, it's rare. All right, let's just check this out. If I if I don't pull up, we won't see this. Back there, please. Man. So for the panel, uh, if uh, if your hilum's been clamped and you start your resection and you see from your your parenchymal edge that you start having um, bleeding, what what thought goes through your mind? Is there an accessory yeah. vessel you look for? Do you continue okay. with the resection? Uh, what Good. what's your algorithm? Um, I generally will make an attempt to look. If I think it's, a, right it's here, pretty please. brisk, I'll make an attempt to look for a second vessel. But I have not had a lot of success with that. I tend just to work through it. I haven't had to. Um, um, for a second clamp, I usually use two bulldogs. So if I have, I generally just work through it. I haven't had a, haven't had a reason to do anything else yet uh, today. So. And that's where your assistant is, is crucial uh, to be able to talk appropriately for you um, in those situations. I think if you're doing, if you're using bulldogs, uh, more often than not, you you've missed. Either the main renal artery, or there's another artery that you didn't see on the imaging. Uh, and in that case, I think if it's arterial, uh, you're, you're, if you've got the vein clamped and you've got one artery unclamped, you, it could turn into a bloody mess. I, I would actually stop and go look for that other vessel. Um, but if it's venous, I think you can just keep working through it. Yeah. Eric, any experience in taking the or, clamp off the vein in that yeah. in that situation? Early uh, I, I was going to say, I, I usually work through it, but yeah. it's interesting. There are times where you take that vein clamp off and it just totally stops. You have an egress for that blood to drain that kidney and that bleeding from the parenchyma stops. So, you know, that's obviously a trick that you can use in your back pocket if you can't work through it. But generally, most of it is tolerable. I think the majority of the reason uh, is either an, a bifurcation of the renal artery, an accessory uh, renal artery, and if the vein is clamped, uh, you're just uh, developing a uh, an increased pressure and buildup, uh, but it's something that to, to think in the back of your mind to really skeletonize that hilum and expose all the vessels that, uh, to, to, and to look on your preoperative imaging, see if there's a branch. Okay. It's got a little hyalur vessel here. It's nothing major. It's just running down. It looks, it looks like vasa visorum though, Jim. It looks like a yeah. tiny little vasa right it's on the artery. Here. It's not a big deal. I'm not going to yeah. tell you about it. But. Good. So, um, you know, it's, as you can see, I think one of the things about retroperitoneal that people are concerned about is the space, but we've got lots of space here. You can see plenty of space in here. You know, most of the guys that are doing trans cases are this close to their work when they're doing transperitoneal, so it's not, it's not a big difference. Oh, we have a question. I'm oh, sorry, go ahead. Thank you. 
Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. To, to do a retrograde? No. Uh, I, I would not. I don't know if anyone else on the panel would. I didn't really see the collecting system that was opened at all. And um, even if it was, the compression he's got there should be adequate, I would think, uh, pressure to you know cause downstream flow. Um, I don't know. Would, would anybody else here consider doing a... I, I never have, and usually if it's large, you see it. If it's small, it, it's going to get closed with your deep layer. Yeah, I don't think we're in. I, I think your I think your point is that it's a deep lesion. Yeah, I don't yeah. think you are either. I think nice, your point nice is it's a deeper closure. section. You're concerned, but I think he's fine. Are you using flow seal or surge flow, Jim? This is flow seal, I believe. Yeah, flow which are surge flow and flow seal are, as everybody yeah, knows, the same sure. thing just granulated gel foam. Uh, so it's a hemostatic matrix rather than a fibrin sealant. Nope. Okay. okay, let's have a drain. I think we're good. Let's have a drain. I think we're good. All right. Well, you did it perfectly in the time that was allotted. We actually have about five minutes to spare. Uh, do we have any other questions from the audience for Dr. Porter? Well, Jim, thank you so much for a, a, a wonderful case. Uh, any comments from the panel to, to Dr. Porter? No, I would just uh, really congratulate you, Jim, on, on a beautiful uh, case and dissection and uh, example. That's my pleasure. Thanks for, uh, no. thanks for watching. And, uh, I uh, hope you all have a great meeting. I uh, hope you all have a great meeting.